message is from Church of Christ the King, based in Brighton and Home in the UK. For more information about us, visit our website, cck.org.uk. We are in the book of Samuel as a church. We're in chapter 17 today. It's a very, very long chapter, so we're going to do it over two Sundays. We'll finish it next week, start it this week. I'm going to read the first 30 verses. You'll be familiar with the story probably because it's one of the most famous stories in the Bible. It is the story, of course, of David and Goliath. Uh, it's, uh, in my opinion, quite fitting that we happen to get to the story on the same weekend that uh, Brighton and Hove Albion managed to defeat the mighty Newcastle United. <laughs> With one, with one smooth stone, they took down a giant, <laughs> Newcastle United. I lived in Newcastle for four years, so I know what a big deal that will be up north uh, to the, the people up there will tremble. <laughs> Tell it not in gaff. Okay, so chapter 17, verses 1 to 30, let me read to you. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the, other si on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul 
And they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches. And will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine? And takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. And David said, what, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this book. We thank you for our time together. We thank you for your presence amongst us by the Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Father, for your dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shines through each page of Scripture. We pray that we would see him clearly today and be changed by the encounter. We pray, meet with us, speak to us, shape our hearts and transform us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. This is uh, justly a famous story, one of the great stories. Even if you're not a Christian, even if you don't believe in God, you would, uh, you would love this story. It's hard not to love it. It's kind of written into our hearts. We, we are attracted to the story of the noble and righteous underdog who defeats the, the brawn of, uh, of malicious intent, this, this kind of wicked force, Goliath, who's, who's more than a soldier. He's kind of a, a force of nature. He's, he's, he's armed not only with a, a spear and, and a shield and so on, he's armed with a person. Did you notice? He's actually got a, one of his armory is, is actually a bloke who has to hold some of it for him. He's that huge. He's that much of a force to be reckoned with. And he's such a force that the entire Israelite army is cowed into submission. For 40 days, nobody has dared lift their head against this giant. It, they are trembling with terror. And yet this uh, boy is the one who finally threatens, challenges, and defeats him. This boy, I and mean, he really is a boy. As you read the story, you, you can't help getting the impression that the, the storyteller wants you to understand his youthfulness. He he's doesn't come into this story as a, as a prepared soldier. He doesn't come in as, as Russell Crowe. He, he comes in as just your, your little brother who's actually in the wrong place at the wrong time and needs a clip around the ear and to be sent home and look after the sheep. That's where he should be right now. And yet, it's this little tiny weakling who triumphs over the giant. What a delicious story. We love this story. Now, now, it's worth pausing to reflect why we love this story. What is it about stories like this that cause just about everybody, it seems to me, to, to rise up with a sense of wonder, a sense of right being done, justice being done, someone standing up to the evil bully and triumphing. It, it, it makes us cheer. But, but why, why should it? Let me ask that question especially to you if you, if you think that there isn't a God. I, I grant you, probably the reason you're here is at least you're open to the idea that there's a God. But 
probably the majority of people in Brighton, if they believe in God, they don't believe in the God of this book. And yet they would still say, well, that's a great story. It's a story of right being done over wrong. Why should that make anybody pleased? If there's no such thing as right and wrong, if there's no such thing as justice, if there's no such thing as good or evil, then why is it that this story makes our hearts glow? Because that's actually what you have to say. If there really isn't a God, if there isn't, really isn't a God who is ruling over history, who has plans, who, who is in favor of goodness and against wickedness, shouldn't it be that, that actually good and evil don't really exist then? If there's no God to champion the good over the evil, who's to say what is good and who's to say what is evil? In the end, it's really down to who wins. In fact, if you to believe in the, the, the very modern, normal, popular, accepted view of, of evolution by natural selection, that the, the, the strong thrive and the weak are defeated, that those who, who thrive through history and prehistory are the strong species, then why should it give us any pleasure that there should be a story of this weakling overtaking the strong? That shouldn't please us at all. It's a strange story. It's just a, it's a blip. It's an anomaly. It's a, it's a mistake in the evolutionary pattern. Why should it please us? If all there is is force and nature, which is, is frankly what the common worldview teaches. I mean, that, that's a direct quote. That what Probably the most famous proponent of atheism in the world today, Richard Dawkins, who only lives a couple of hundred miles away in Oxford, he, he would say that there is no good no evil, no right, no wrong. There is only blind, pitiless indifference. That's it. That's the world. That's a great scientist, very respected, very received in contemporary culture. People would say, well, he knows what he's talking about. He says there is nothing to this universe to make you think there's any purpose, any meaning, any good, any evil. There is no point to it. There is just blind, pitiless indifference. Well, it sounds like Goliath to me. Blind, pitiless indifference. No compassion, no concern for the weak, no concern for the righteous. Just blind, pitiless force. And yet, somehow, deep down, we know that Goliath deserves to get taken down. And that someone righteous should triumph, don't we? Somehow we know that that can't be the ultimate story. There must be something good in the world. There must be something righteous worth fighting for. There must be. And so our sentiments betray us. We know too much to believe or go along with the prevailing atheistic worldview. We just do. And I challenge you, if you say, or maybe you're just watching this on the website or in one of the many sites that we meet in, you, you, may, be, you may be right now thinking, well, I, I've never really thought of it like that. I've always assumed that there's no God and, and that we just make the best meaning for our lives that we can. But what kind of meaning can you make if there's no good or evil? There's no purpose. There's no meaning to history. No, the good news is there is meaning to history. There is a God who's planning things, working things out for his great purpose. And as we often say, history is his story. That's a, an adequate definition of the word. It's his story. He's planning it. He's working it out. And it seems interesting to me that we, as the people of history, humanity, we, we kind of, wherever you cut us, we have this prevailing sense there must be a right, there must be a wrong, there must be meaning in life. We can't live otherwise. We're like sticks of bright and rock. Wherever you cut us, we, we, we know there's meaning, we know there's right, we know there's wrong. And so the David and Goliath story fits in with so many other stories that sort of tell the same story. <laughs> right down to soccer fixtures or Tom and Jerry or John Grisham movies. If you notice, they're always the same. These, top, these kind of... David and Goliath ideas of the, the small but right beating the massive but cruel. And so it should be, because we know deep down that there's something, there's something right about that. It shouldn't be down to who's the strongest dominating the weak. It should be that there's right in this world. And do you know what makes this even more remarkable? Is that if the Bible tells any story at all, that's about it. God who is actually all-powerful, 
became weak to defeat a wicked, powerful foe. That's it. God, who is mighty, instead of just squashing the devil, as he could have done, he decided to become weak. He became a baby. He became like David, just a, a, just a weak little boy on the battlefield. And this same God, not only did he become a baby, but he grew up in the poorest state area, the poorest nation, the most despised part of the world, treated like a slave, despised, rejected, all kinds of questions being asked about his provenance. People saying, well, he's, he's a bastard. He's not, even, he's not even got a father. He's from a, he's from a bad background. This is, this, this, this is a, a, a mess, this child. He's got no future, no prospects. And yet this, this young boy became the man that, that was ultimately going to defeat evil. And he even defeated evil in shame, in weakness, in nakedness on a cross. David took on his Goliath as a little boy, a little shabby boy on a battlefield in a valley. Jesus took on his Goliath naked on a cross, despised, covered in shame, humiliation. Just who are you? What a weakling. What a failure you are. They even shouted at him while he was on the cross. If you're the son of God, why can't you save yourself, let alone save the human race? You're a failure. You're a loser. But meanwhile, this weakling, Jesus, was taking down the greatest Goliath there ever was. The power of evil, the power of sin, the power of death. Jesus defeated his Goliath. That's the story the Bible teaches. The whole story, actually, in a nutshell, God wins in the end. I read to the end of the book, sorry to give that away. That's God's plan through history. And you know it, don't you? You know that. You know that surely God must win. Right must win. Surely there must be a plan through history. There must be a purpose. Yes, you're not wrong. There is. God has one. And, and the wise person will be the one who says, right, I, I want to join God. <laughs> even if that means I have to join him in weakness, even if it means I have to be humiliated and carry the cross and go through shame and be like David, standing alone in a valley against a giant, feeling feeble, feeling outnumbered, trembling sometimes with fear, but ultimately knowing God will vindicate me because God has a plan. God is faithful. God is committed to his own. God chooses champions from weaklings and raises them up. That's not just David's story. It's not just Jesus' story. It's supposed to be our story as well. You get to have the same story because you can belong to Jesus Christ. Belong to the champion of champions and, and have his power at work in your life, even when you feel terribly weak. So this, this can be our story, this extraordinary tale of, of, of victory in the midst of weakness. But it does mean that your story is necessarily a story of battle. It really is. That life is a battle. I'm sure you've noticed that by now. It's a conflict. It's full of wars. It's full of, it's full of strain. It's full of antagonism, enemies. It's, it's full of things you would rather not have to face, but find you just have to by virtue of having a pulse. You just, I've got to face problems and difficulties. I've got to battle on. Now, if that's true of normal life, I'm afraid it's especially true of the Christian life. So if you became a Christian, you signed up for war. Sorry if we didn't tell you that at the time. But you did. You got, you got signed up. You got commissioned for battle. It's, it's part of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. He's very clear about that. He, he made no bones about it. You get famous places like in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 10, where he, he says, I mean, he's, this is not one of the comforting verses that you stick on a magnet on your fridge, but it's in the Bible. It says this, verse 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. Oh, I thought you had. Oh, everyone thought you had Jesus. I thought that was the whole mission. Well, he says, don't think that. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. That's an important verse. We, we do well to remember it because it, it helps to make sense of so much of the Christian life. By following Jesus, you get issued with a sword. Spiritually speaking, that's exactly what it's like. It's a battle. To really follow Christ, wake up and get ready to fight. It will feel like a fight, often. Doesn't it sometimes? Do you know what I mean? It, it can feel like it at the times when you're ready for it. 
when we've been through two weeks of prayer and fasting as a church and we're signed up for war and we know it's a battle, we know it's tough, and it can be a battle when you're not feeling like it, when you're not ready, when you thought, oh, I thought it was going to be a restful weekend, I thought it was going to be a nice week, I thought this was going to be a nice month. What we find when we sign up to follow Jesus is that we've made a wonderful friend, we've also made a very bad enemy. And he doesn't play nice, this enemy. He inspired Goliath. That's the kind of enemy he is. That's the kind of friends he keeps. He's vicious. He's cruel. He's cunning. He won't wait for the nice time in the month for you. He will hit you when you're down. He'll, he'll drag you through ser- p- periods of disappointment and discouragement and then turn your friends against you. He'll, he'll make you feel sick at times when you need your health desperately. He'll, he'll, he'll call into question all kinds of relationships that you thought were tight and true. You'll, you'll feel often like you're surrounded, you're besieged, you're struggling. You think, this, this, this is, is this the Christian life? You bet it is. You bet it is. It's a battle. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Sign up for war if you're coming to follow Jesus Christ. It is a battle. There are many great religious movements in history whose leaders were all philosophers. <laughs> uh, there are great sort of systems of thought worldviews. If you, if you want to understand Western philosophy, the great heroes of Western philosophy are thinkers who sat around stroking beards in, in, in academies and universities and writing diatribes against each other. The heroes of this book are mostly soldiers. So that's a little hint there. Mostly soldiers. Many of them living their lives in repetitive danger. Constant danger. Because that's what it's like to follow this God. God is a warrior. God is at war. He's been at war from the beginning. This this book tells the story of a war. A war that he's destined to win, but a war nevertheless. So we need to be real about that and face it head on. Even if we can sometimes feel weakened in the process. Paul describes his life towards the very, very end. I love these words. In, in 2 Timothy, this is one of the great heroes, perhaps the greatest hero besides Jesus of the Christian church. The marvelous apostle Paul, who summarized his life in these wonderful words right at the very end. He's writing this letter to his young protege, Timothy. And he says, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That's his language. I I fought the fight. I didn't just go to the meetings. I fought. It was it was a fight. It it was a it was a white knuckle ride. It was it was cold. It was blistering. There was cuts and bruises. There were moments of agony, moments of anguish. But I fought. I came through. I finished my race. And by the grace of God, I prevailed. Friends, if that's not going to be the thing that we say at the end of our Christian life, it will be because we didn't get to the end. I'm afraid that's what we need to be able to say. When when you stand before God, or when you get to that point just before you stand before him, maybe on a deathbed somewhere, or whatever circumstance you find yourself in, that's the prize, to be able to say at the end of it, I fought a good fight. It, It is a fight. It's a battle that we keep pressing through on. Not pointlessly, not meaninglessly, sure to prevail, but a battle nevertheless. And God's kind enough to warn us about it. But let's just bring out a few particulars from this battle faced by God's great servant in this story, because there are so many lessons for us to learn directly here. And as I say, we've got two weeks in it, because it's such a rich story, and I I can't do it justice in two weeks, really, let alone in one. So let me just pull out a couple of things today. It's a battle against more than one enemy. The obvious enemy is Goliath. (laughs) Anyone would have been uh, accepting. He's, He's the key enemy. He's the one that we could see. But have you noticed, even while we've been reading the story, we've only read half of it, and there's a few other enemies popping up. One of the enemies is simply the status quo. Status quo. 40 days. Nobody in the whole army is thinking of fighting. This is the, the, the army of, of, 
of the people of God, Israel, and not, not one single soldier has been stirred or, or prevailed upon or, or, or decided to stick their head above the parapet for the, for the part of a second to, to think, oh, could, we, could we challenge this man? Nobody seems to be doing it. There is a prevailing status quo. We will not take this guy on. That is actually the first enemy our boy David has to face. And it's the same with all of us. To follow Jesus Christ tends to mean that at least, at least at times in your life, you find yourself going against the grain. You find yourself going against the, the way that everybody assumes that we will do this. This is how we will behave. This is how we'll speak. This is what we will allow. This is what we'll permit. You, you find yourself having to just go edging against it and, and feeling sometimes a terrible sense of awkwardness, a terrible sense of perhaps embarrassment and humiliation because, well, I... I, I'm afraid <laughs> I can't go along. I, I, I accept that the, the status quo has its, has its strengths to it. And I can accept that it would probably be quite nice and wise and safe for me to go along with the, the, the prevailing mood. But I can't. I just can't. So we find ourselves like David, having to be the only one sometimes in a situation, saying, uh, 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 what, about, what about what God says? What about, what about Jesus? What about faithfulness to Jesus? What about his plan? And it's hard to do that in any culture. What's sometimes even harder is when you have to do it inside the Christian world. Because you can accept that by standing up as a Christian in contemporary Brighton, you do stand out a little bit. Have you noticed that? <laughs> we stand out. I mean, we do. Christian churches in Brighton, that's, that's a little bit unusual, especially growing ones with lots of people. Wow, that looks weird. But what about even within the church or within the Christian circles that you might be in? Sometimes to go with the convictions that God has given you, to be full of faith and to expect that, yes, by God's grace, I'm going to fight on this one. I'm going to prevail and I'm going to push through. You can be surprised to find that it's not non-Christians that you'd have trouble with, but Christians, God's people, sometimes even some of the best of God's people. It's a huge thing to walk through. It's a huge thing for every generation to walk through. In fact, we'll perhaps touch more on this next week when we talk about David being asked to put on Saul's armor. But what is often the case with leaders in the church is that they want to take God seriously. They feel God saying, I want you to do this for me. And, and so they start to gather their courage and start planning and start thinking. And they, they start to assume that as soon as they roll out their new plan, all the people of God in the church will be waving their palm branches and singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, the leader has come to bring a glorious revolution in church affairs. We're so pleased for you. Yes, you can change the carpets. Go for it. <laughs> and church history is the story of the surprises which people have had when they felt, oh, oh, so people didn't want change. People didn't want us to challenge this. People didn't want the status quo to be different. They just thought the status quo was good enough. Even though Goliath hasn't been taken down for 40 days, there's this prevailing assumption that if we just stay put and do nothing, he'll hopefully just go away. You know, Albert Einstein said the definition of insanity is to carry on doing the same thing you've always done, but expect different results. It's very easy to do that religiously. Church is to carry on doing the same thing as always, and just assume, well, one day the, the glory will just come and it will all be perfect. We'll just carry on having church exactly as we've always done it, never make any change. And leaders have to sometimes gather courage like a David and say, do you know what? You're not going to like this, but we're going to change things. And then they have to duck because it's never immediately popular. With some people it's popular. Some people love change. As soon as you say the word change, even if it's let's start worshipping Satan. Yes, change! Change is a great thing, and we just like change because, by definition, change pleases us. Well, and there's other people that are more suspicious and take time. There are other people that are dead against it. And wise leaders have to go through a process of thinking, well, can I do this? How do I do this? How do I communicate change? How do, how do we get to the point where we're going forward with what God has called us to do? And you must be wise, but you also must be courageous. David had to be courageous say the thing that no one was going to say. 
church, even though probably everybody's thinking it. That's the funny thing with courage. I don't know if you found this. Sometimes we have this strange idea that what's needed is a brand new idea that will solve the problem seamlessly and painlessly. But it never comes. What's usually needed is for someone to do the thing that everybody thinks should be done. <laughs> I've noticed in leadership over the few years that I've been a leader in church circles, not just here, but around the country in different places, that uh, you can usually tell where there's a situation that needs leadership, and that is where the same conversation seems to be happening every week for about five years. Think, oh, gosh, we're having the same conversation happening for ages. Could it be that someone needs to make a courageous decision? What we're hoping for is that the decision will get made for us, that Goliath will just walk away. But rarely does that happen. Praise God when it does. Praise God when it does. But sometimes you simply have to grasp the nettle. Now, I'm talking about church leadership, but this is true in all of our jobs, our, our family life. Friends, part of being a warrior Going to battle, doing what Jesus says and taking the sword is making costly decisions that we know will hurt us sometimes for weeks, maybe months before they even begin to bear fruit. Ouch. Isn't that hard? It's hard as leaders, I tell you that. When we say, let's do this new thing because we believe this is the right thing to do. And you know you're going to hit some difficulties and problems, but you still keep going boldly. And then it sometimes takes a long time before it really begins to bear, bear fruit. In that season, the metal gets very tested, and what's needed is courage and conviction. Friends, courage and conviction is not the exclusive possession of a few people in the church. We all of us have the Spirit of God within us. And you may be facing a situation at your workplace which has been like this for the equivalent of 40 days or more. And you've been waiting for a situation, to, you've been waiting for a deliverance, you're waiting for someone to get sacked or someone to leave, or so, and you're suddenly beginning to realize, even while I'm talking, maybe the onus is on me to go and confront the issue, to go and speak to this person, to go and sort this out. I, I don't envy you, that's tough, but trust me, you're walking the right path, you're walking David's path. Be courageous, take a lead. I'm pleased to say in this church, I am so thrilled <laughs> at the sense of responsiveness amongst the people of God. You are not hearing me saying this because I'm bitter and twisted about how bad this church is at embracing change and going forward. I mean, just this last two weeks. Let's have two weeks of prayer and fasting. Do you realize this, if there's any community of 1,200 people in the, on planet Earth you could say that to and have them say, great idea, <laughs> I'd like to know what it is. This church is, is astonishing. You guys are amazing. You should all give yourself a big hug because this has been an amazing fortnight we've just come through. It shows that there's a sense of comradeship and togetherness and willingness to pursue the plan. But sometimes it takes leadership to maintain that atmosphere. And that may be something that applies to you in your family, in your workplace, maybe even in your marriage. Friends, take courage. Sometimes the answer is not out there somewhere. It's right in front of you. It's just that you need to grab hold of God and take courage. That's not the only thing that we see here. We also see that, that he has specific antagonism. He's not just being confronted with the status quo. He's also being confronted with specific suspicion and cruelty. You look right down there at verse 28. This is his big brother. It's, it's very revealing. Doesn't it sound, if, you, if you're in a family with lots of siblings, this sounds all too familiar. Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David and said, Why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. Ouch. <laughs> Isn't that painful? It's interesting that David's response, actually, he doesn't say much up until this point. David's not talked a lot in the whole book of Samuel yet. He's been around for a couple of chapters. One of the first things he says is, What have I done now? Even this brave, mighty young man has those moments of pain just because of sibling rivalry, it seems. See, see rivalry and antagonism can, can weave its way into the heart of a family even. And, and isn't, it, isn't it revealing and precious, actually, that this great dramatic chapter of the Bible has space even for those sensitivities? Oh, 
my brother, my brother, I wish that you would for once encourage me. Here I am suggesting that we take this man out. And all I get from you is not just suspicion, but accusation of wickedness in my heart. It's really hard, friends. When you, when you take steps for God, you want to do something for God. You want to obey God. But what you get back, even from people you look up to, those you would trust and respect, and those you would hope would be the first to cheer you on and say, yes, David, at last, David, I'm so proud of you, David. What you hear from them is attack. It happens. I'm afraid to say it happens quite a lot. Some of our greatest heroes in church history. William Booth started the Salvation Army about 130 years ago, 140 years ago. Extraordinary movement, brave, courageous lion-like people with a passion to preach Jesus to the poorest of the poor. And they used methods that were revolutionary. They used music and styles of clothes and styles of assembly that were deliberately groundbreaking because they knew that to engage the culture of the people they needed to reach, they were going to have to break a few molds. They are going to have to be a little different. Now, Lord Shaftesbury who most of us would have heard of as the, the great earl who, who loved the poor and had a, was so famous for his compassion for the poor of London that when he died, his funeral procession was as grand as it had ever been. Millions knew of him and celebrated him. In fact, today, there's Shaftesbury Avenue near Piccadilly Circus, and the statue of Eros was originally placed there to commemorate Lord Shaftesbury, who changed countless laws to protect the underprivileged of industrial London. He was a great hero for Christ. When William Booth started dressing up as a general and had his people do songs from the pubs to tell people about Jesus, Shaftesbury went into print saying that Booth was the Antichrist. This is Shaftesbury, the big brother, the Eliha. What have I done now? Friends, if you choose to follow God wholeheartedly, Please don't be too surprised if even those you hope will be pleased with you turn against you. And please do not be derailed. Don't. Temptation will come to say, well, they spoke against me. I I, I can't cope with that. I can't cope with the abuse. I can't cope with the reaction. I give up. No, 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 no. The warrior presses through. The warrior has to. Otherwise, there's no war. There's no victory. So David, it's beautiful what it says. David, verse 30, after speaking from the heart, wasn't it just a word I said? Verse 30, he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. So David, utterly stung by this flaming arrow from his brother, what does he do? Picks himself up again and fights on. I'm still going to go for this. Even if Eliab speaks against me. Friends, Eliab will speak against you. If you pursue God, you will get opposed. I I wish it wasn't the case, but Jesus said himself, he actually warned against it, woe to you when all men speak well of you. Woe to you. There's something wrong. If everybody's on the sidelines cheering you on, you want to stop and think, why is is this going on? This can't be right. I'm very popular. Hmm. In fact, to, to complete the passage that we read from a moment ago in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus goes on to say, after speaking about a sword, he says, For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's radical, isn't it? Shocking. Did Jesus really say that? I've come to turn on you against your parents. It sounds like, a, like John Lennon. Is that it? Is he just a rebel? Does he just hate parents, hate family, disintegration of society? That's my cause. I hate the old-fashioned nuclear family. I'm against that. I'm in with the 60s generation. Not at all. Jesus was always honoring to authority. Jesus respected the family. Jesus loved his mother, saw that she was looked after, even to his dying breath. 
but he understood that even the best things, including family, can become idols to us. Even the things that God has taught us to cherish, we can over-cherish. We can replace God with them to our destruction. And there are times we have to choose between, do I keep this person happy or do I please God? Jesus warns us, I'm warning you, you must, you must press through the pain. For some of us, it's as simple as becoming a Christian. Maybe you're here today, the only reason you've never become a Christian before is because you're frightened of what your husband will say or your wife will say. You're frightened of what your, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, and it, it really turns you over inside. You're frightened of what they'll say at work. Your mind is fixed on Eliab, the older brother, instead of what God has said to you. You know it's true. There are people who don't come to this church, even though they became Christians, as it's, as it's, so to speak. They say, well, I'll become a Christian. They, maybe they sign a box or raise a hand. But they go home and tell people, I became a Christian at the church today. And that's the end of the story. No, you didn't. No, you did not. You're not going back there. Oh, okay, I won't go back there again. I, don't, I certainly don't want, to, I don't want to cross you. That's fine. And there's a beautiful respect there. Don't get me wrong. We are commanded to respect our parents. God wants that for us. But you can overdo it. You can get to the point where you forgot who God was. Oh, I can't cross my older brother. I can't cross my... I, I, I can't, not even for God. Well, who is your God then? Who is your God? I won't get baptized. Okay, I'll become a Christian, but to get baptized, that's just putting it too far. That's, that seems like a step of rebellion against the way I was brought up. I understand, friends. I understand. And I certainly wouldn't want to, I, I would not want to diminish your conscience on that. I understand. But listen, if you know what God says about, baptism, about baptisms, you'll understand that there's a place for radical obedience. I press through. I press through, especially if you've come of age, especially if you're at a place where you know you need to make decisions for yourself. Now, I thank God. I, I'm blessed with a family where the atmosphere is one of mutual respect and praise. My parents, even when I disagree, even when we've thought differently about some things, there's such a, I'm so grateful for the way there's been support and encouragement. But I know that isn't the story for many of us, maybe not even for most of us. And, and I want to urge you, friends, recognize Recognize opposition for what it is. Recognize traps, distractions, barriers to faith. See them for what they are. Say, God, I will pursue you. I will go into battle, even if I have to be spoken against, even if I have to face the pain of misunderstanding. And not just misunderstanding. Look at the way he speaks to him. You've come down here. Why? What about the sheep in the wilderness? You're being irresponsible. I know your presumption and the evil in your heart. What a thing to say. I know the evil in your heart. Wow. What do you do with that when you're accused of evil because you want to do what God says? What do you, how do you handle that? There's all kinds of options, aren't there? Including reaction. <laughs> Including accuse back. How dare you accuse me? I'm the one that wants to sling a stone at Goliath, you wicked, cowardly older brother. Tempting. No, he just moves on. He moves on. Don't react. Don't let pride be the issue. David is not interested in his reputation. What's he interested in? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? That's what he's interested in. He is defaming the God of Israel. The glory of David doesn't come into it. He doesn't come into it. All right, I probably am full of evil. <laughs> Fair enough, accuse me, but I'm not going to stop doing what God told me. I, I've heard, you've heard me tell this story before, most of you probably, but one of my favorite stories, a preacher from a few years ago who was being accused and slandered and all kinds of lies coming into print about him. He found it so painful, so painful. And he went to God in prayer and said, God, they're speaking against me. They're lying about me. They're slandering me. It's so hard. I just wrote, he wrote a book, a controversial book about something that, that really stirred people up. Got a lot of hatred for it. All I did was I, I, I just did what I thought God told me to do. What have I done? What have I said? It wasn't just a word. It's just a book. And God spoke to him, said to him, 
listen, the worst thing they can say about you is not as bad as the truth. And he says it set him free. He was happy from that point on. See, you will get accused of stuff. I'll get accused, pastors, elders, all kinds of things. We, we all get accusations. And sometimes they may not even be that wide of the mark. Ouch. That's the hard thing. Eliab, he knows David. He's probably got a bit of dirt on him. He probably knows, yeah, David, you know what? You are a bit of a clown. You probably shouldn't be here in some ways. You know, you're out of order. David's not bothered. Okay, fair enough. You have to be like Martin Luther. He used to say, when the devil came to accuse him at night and tell him of his sins, and Martin Luther, who had rediscovered the doctrine of justification by faith alone, he says, I say back to the devil, yes, devil, you are right. All these sins have I done and many more. Would you like me to tell you some of them? But they have all, all been heaped on Christ, all been placed on him. And I am righteous in him. You stand in that, in your righteousness that comes as a gift. You don't get self-righteous. You don't puff yourself up and say, how dare you speak? I'm God's man, aren't I? I'm the, I'm the one with faith and courage. Who are you? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. You're, you're a brand plucked from the burning. That's who you are. You're just the son of Jesse. You're just a, just a shepherd boy. But I have a great God, and I trust him. I trust him. Stand in the identity that God gives you. And for some of you, the application is actually that you, you're, a, you're an Eliab. You've never seen it before, but you've been guilty of holding people back. This is ever so subtle because sometimes we hold people back for reasons that we think are very good. Really good. We want people to be more sensible. You shouldn't give that money to God. You shouldn't risk that. You shouldn't do this. And friends, there's a place for that. There's a place for sensible, wise counsel. And some people are foolhardy and they need to be told when they're being stupid. But be careful that your desire for wisdom doesn't creep over to a, to a desire to control and manipulate someone. Stop them in actually their destiny. They're called to do something great for God, just like you are. Give space to people. Be careful. If you find yourself, as I'm preaching, thinking, gosh, I've been holding her back, holding him back. Just repent. Just do business with God. You've got some time today. Why don't you just say, God, I'm sorry, I don't want to be an older brother. Not like that. I want to be a good older brother. I want to be on the sideline cheering. I want to be supportive in every way that I can. With wisdom, with genuine love. Speaking the truth in love, but in love. To strengthen and help and protect and support and send you on your way. Faithfully.